Heavenly Father, I recall the words of the psalmist. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from the rivers of your delight. Lord God, by your hand, all of our needs are met. By your hand, all of our deepest desires are fulfilled. Lord God, your word says that every good and perfect gift comes down from above, coming down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Heavenly Father, thank you for this new year that you've given us. And Heavenly Father, thank you that you are the same God yesterday, today, and forever. You are a very present help in our time of need. And thank you, Lord, more than anything for the kindness and the love that you've so lavished upon us in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the power of the gospel message. Make us today to have eyes that see what you want us to see, Lord. Give us ears, Lord, that help us to hear what you would have us to hear. And make us all like to be like, to be like the servant that you speak of in Isaiah 66, verse number 2. As you say, but this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Holy Spirit, cause us to tremble at your word today. Increase our fear of you, our awe, and our reverence of you, Lord. Give us a white hot affection that burns for you, Lord. And I trust in you now, Jesus. And I pray for myself that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, Lord, that they would be pleasing to you. And that everything that I would say, Lord, would be an act of faithful worship to you, Lord. I trust in you, and I know that you keep your promises. Is in the precious, beautiful name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. Happy New Year. How are you guys doing? Good. So my name is AJ Robbins, and it is my absolute honor, absolute honor to stand before you, to stand behind the Word of God, to preach the Word of God, and to proclaim this gospel message that God has given us today. I'm in our pastor's cohort, myself and three other gentlemen. We have the privilege of being under Barrett Bowden, our lead pastor, where we're being trained up in doctrine, in prayer, in our character as we aspire to the office of an overseer one day to be sent out as pastors, theologians, church planters, missionaries, whatever the Lord would have for us. And do keep in your hearts and in your prayers our lead pastor, Barrett Bowden. He's been in sabbatical that God has blessed him with this past month, and he'll be there for another month. So do please pray for him. Pray for his wife and his two daughters, if you would. And praise God that even when our lead pastor is gone, that God has blessed us as a healthy church, that even when our lead pastor is gone, that week after week, that we can hear the gospel proclaimed and the word of God taught by faithful men. And I've been so blessed by not only the teaching that we've seen, but also by the testimonies that we've heard. So God is on the move here, and he's on the move here today. And quickly, as we enter into our last week of our Come Let Us Adore Him series, our Christmas series, I want to refresh our minds and hopefully refresh your heart on where we've been before we move on to where we're going. We heard from Matthew about the peace and the rest that comes from knowing Jesus Christ. You heard from Mitchell of the humility of the Christmas story, the generous God, that, th that those who know him are now generous too. You heard from John Caleb, the hope that we have in Christ and the anticipation that the, the followers of Christ have, not only as we look back to his first coming, but the anticipation that he will come again one day as Lord and as King. And our dear brother Rob Hodum last week, he reminded us that there's so much joy in trusting God, walking in his spirit daily, abiding in him, walking in his ways. And last but not least, this week we'll talk about sharing and spreading. So the title of the sermon today is Heralds of the Gospel, Sharing and Spreading. And thinking about this Christmas narrative and sharing and spreading, you see it right in the middle of God's word, Luke 1 and 2, the Christmas narrative. Recall the story. 
the angel of the Lord appears to the shepherds in the middle of the night. He says, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. So we read it's the sharing that people must know of this message. And I was thinking, not only do we read about it, we also sing about it. Do you remember the hymn, Go Tell It on the Mountain? Do you know the words? Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountains that Jesus Christ is born. Y'all sound good. So it's what we read about. It's what we even sing about in our songs as an exhortation to share and to spread. And consider if we know God to be the giver of peace and rest, the, the humble God who is so generous in his grace, the God that gives us hope and, and gives us the anticipation, the giver of joy as we trust him. Shouldn't these things be for all people and not just for those here today? So consider in the same way that the angels were the first heralds or the first messengers of the gospel message, we too are, partake, are to partake in the sharing and of the spreading of this message. And this morning we'll have two texts. The first, uh, it'll be from Romans chapter 1, verses number 16 and 17. And if you want to doggy ear that second one, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses number 1 through number 5. So the book of Romans, it's Paul, the Apostle Paul, he writes a letter to the church in Rome. And many commentators say that if, if, they, if Paul had a thesis statement, if Paul wanted you to get one thing from this book, perhaps it would be verses number 16 and 17. I'll read from the English Standard Version today. It'll be up here on the screen. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. This is God's word. The Bible, it it explicitly tells us to share a certain message, the gospel. But how can we share something that we haven't first heard, understood, and embraced ourselves? So what is the gospel? Could you tell me? Could you tell a friend if his life depended upon it? And I think in in today's world that will say, oh, well, well, that's true for you. All truth is relative. Or you'll hear a message, a cheap message that says, well, God is just tolerant. He's accepting of who I am because he made me this way. But this is not what the Bible teaches. You see, the Bible teaches that there is something that fundamentally separates you from right relationship with God. The Bible calls it sin. And it it may not make me popular here today, and it certainly wouldn't make me popular outside of here in a secular world today. But I love you. Hear me say that I love you, and I say this in love. There is something that separates us from God, and it's our sin. We have all offended God with our sin, scoffed at his authority, rejected him as Lord, and have each categorically gone against him. Genesis 6, early in the Bible, it describes the true spiritual nature of mankind. The seven-word evaluation of man. Every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So our spiritual diagnosis, it's not just yeah, kind of bad It's a grave diagnosis. And since I love you, I have to tell you. And I know it may sting, but such sin, it exiles us from the presence of God. And it exposes us to his right and righteous judgment. And you must understand the reality of this very real judgment day. Deuteronomy 10, it says, God is a just judge. He is not partial and he takes no bribe. He categorically cannot ignore sin. God cannot ignore evil. That's what his word says. And God will not go against his character. Therefore, every sin of man must be accounted for by someone. So if you don't understand this reality of the judgment, 
and the fact that God is a just judge, then you and I and all of our friends and family out there will be duped into thinking we're in right relationship with God. Paul says later in this book of Romans, chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. Wages are what a worker deserves for the work that he's put in. So the Bible teaches that what you and I and all of us deserve for what we've done is death before a holy and very perfect God, more holy than we could even fathom. So the end result of unanswered sin in our lives will be eternal misery. And it may not tingle your ears or make you feel great, but that's okay, because I love you. But ladies and gentlemen, I have some news for you. And praise God that the story doesn't end there. There's some good news for God being so rich in his mercy with which he has lavished upon us. Even when we were dead in these trespasses, sent forth himself as a man, the man Jesus Christ. And this is what we celebrate at Christmas. That God chose the lowly nativity scene, born of a virgin to two peasant parents. In a tiny little town called Bethlehem. There was no room at the inn. So they lay our Lord in a manger. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. Yes, Jesus came in the humility of human flesh. And read Matthew 4. Just like you and I, he was tempted. Just like you and I. But he's not like you and me. Jesus lived a perfect, sinless life. He never once offended his father, never once transgressed against his commandments. Jesus lived a sinless life so worthy of God's blessing and acceptance. While you and I and all of us have lived a sinful life worthy of God's judgment and ultimate condemnation. But Jesus, out of his steadfast love, his long-suffering, patient love for sinners like you and I, chose to lay his life down out of love for you. Even the most humiliating and cruel ways of dying. Death on a cross. And it was on the cross that atonement for sinners was secured. Atonement is the word the Bible uses to show us how can a sinful man be reconciled to a holy God. It is an atonement. And for us it's a substitutionary atonement. The sacrifice of him for ourselves. Christ was the only man not deserving of such a death. It should have been me. It should have been us. Yet Jesus gave himself as an unblemished, perfect sacrifice that could once and for all secure atonement for anyone who would trust in him and repent. And on the cross, the almighty wrath of God was poured out unto his only son. And that is the basis of our atonement. It's not that we were righteous It was that his only son was righteous for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21, it summarizes it well. Paul says, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God made Jesus to be sin for you, so that you, yes you, could be the righteousness of God. That is some good news. And that evening, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. One night, he lay there. Two nights, he laid there. But on the third, at the break of dawn, Jesus rose from the grave. Showing that not only did he defeat sin on the cross, he also defeats death in his resurrection. Praise God. And not only does this good news free us, from the eternal consequences that we deserve. There's also a promise of his indwelling Holy Spirit in you. The presence of God himself comes to live in those who follow him. And it's the spirit of the living God who will bring forth fruit in your life of love, joy, peace. The things our hearts so long for, but in this world, are almost always nearly lacking. And upon faith in the gospel, God restores us to enjoy him and delight in him as he originally intended. And you'll start to say things like Psalm 42, as the deer pants for the water, 
So my soul, O oh Lord, pants for you. Or you'll say things like Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. All the deepest desires of your heart will be fulfilled in Christ. And look at my eyes, look at me. Your decision about the gospel message is single-handedly the most important decision you'll ever make. There's nothing more important, there's nothing more urgent. And I'll say it again for clarity. Your decision about Jesus and this gospel message is the most important thing in your life. And I gotta tell you guys, it's not just a non-specific, fact-based belief in the fact that Jesus died on the cross in the same way that you may believe the history books. But you're not changed by that kind of belief. But the reality is, is it is an act of God by His Holy Spirit to give you a new heart of belief, belief deep-rooted belief as you hear the words of the gospel. Romans 10 says, faith comes through hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And the fruit or the effect of the gospel message is faith and repentance. And faith and repentance can only be brought about by the convincing work of the Holy Spirit. Aspiration, resolution, morality, religiosity are no substitutes for faith. Faith can only be brought about by the convincing work of the Holy Spirit in your heart. The reality is that God, before God moves us by His Spirit, we're just blind to what He's doing, deaf to His speech. But the Spirit of God moves during the hearing of the gospel. A regeneration. It's what Jesus speaks of to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He says, you must be born again. And it's God that gives us this new heart. It's God that saves because it's God that gives faith. Everything in this message is a free gift from God himself out of his sovereign grace. And not only does right response to the gospel involve faith, it also revolves repentance. Acts 13 says, God now commands all men everywhere to repent. So real conversion doesn't just involve saying we're sorry. Yes, it does involve asking for forgiveness. But it goes further into a denial of self as the little G God of your life. And real repentance says, Lord, I now submit to you, the one true God, as King and Lord of my life, both publicly and privately. So if there's not been a conscious, very real moment in your life where you've turned away from sin and yourself and those around you have noticed a change in your demeanor towards godliness, then I would consider today, am I truly trusting Jesus as Lord? Mere credence in words without lasting faith do not save. Mere remorse without repentance does not save. Only the Holy Spirit giving men new hearts that yield fruit of faith and repentance as the gospel is proclaimed will save. And there's an invitation for you today to have this new heart I speak of, to be saved. And there's nothing more important. If, if I could come down there and grab you by your collar and plead with you with every ounce of earnestness in my bones, I would. I would. Because I love you. And I care about your soul. He is inviting you into an inheritance beyond your greatest imagination. He will clothe you in his righteousness. He will save you. There's no heart too hardened. If you would say to me, AJ, you don't understand the sin that I've done. Well, I said, brother, you must not understand the greatness of Jesus' blood. He is mighty to save. Jesus says, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. So I entreat you. I implore you with everything in me. Be reconciled to God. Why would you wait? Our days are numbered. And we don't know when this day of judgment will happen for us. And I know this is a message on sharing and spreading. But I did not want to move forward unless we hear the gospel first proclaimed. And there's different ways to contextualize the gospel. And you see it shared differently in different narratives. But the gospel boiled down to its most essential point is the good news that God restores men to himself 
through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Such good news. Better news than we could even ever fathom. And this isn't just basic doctrine. Comparatively, it's the only doctrine. It's the foundation of the church. It's the root of all our hope. The gospel, the gospel, the gospel. This is our hope for this new year. The power of the gospel. And if we don't first realize its power, then we'll welcome in 2023 and be at the same place. It is the power of the gospel that saves. The Bible describes man's sharing of this gospel message as evangelism. So I'll make two points on evangelism today. And the first is this. There is both duty and privilege in evangelism. So we have established that the giving of faith and salvation is only by sovereign God giving us a free gift of grace. However, evangelism is man's work that he gives to them. And we know in Matthew 28, Jesus gives the Great Commission. Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples. So the Lord commands it. But I want to qualify this word duty before we fall into legalism. Acts 17 says, God is not served by human hands as though he needed anything. So we don't, we don't share this gospel to feel good about ourselves. Because we only feel good because Jesus says so. And he's redeemed us. And we, we don't share it to accumulate reputation and spiritual good works so that others would look upon us. We do it because the Lord says so. And we ultimately know that the chief end of man is to glorify God. And God is glorified when men obey his word. So as such, there is duty in evangelism because God's word says so. And ladies and gentlemen, that should be enough for us to respond with hearts of earnestness and urgency to go and share this message. And I was thinking, not only that, but in Matthew 22, Jesus says, The second greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. And I can think of no greater act of love than for me to share this message that could free my neighbor from sin, bondage, and condemnation than to share this gospel message with him. So if we love God and are ultimately concerned with his glory and his commands to evangelize and also to love our neighbor, then we must respond obediently. And we must see it as an individual and corporate duty to go and share this gospel. And if you remember John 15, Jesus is is speaking to his disciples. He's speaking about the things that he's commanded to them. He says, I've spoken to you these things that my joy may be in you, that your joy may be full. So as such, there's privilege in evangelism. And I want you to see that in, in God's ways, life is just better. All of his commands are yes for his glory, but also for our good and our fullness of life. And in my life, there's nothing more special, no days that were ever better than when God uses me to proclaim this message. In the same way that that God used Andrew to share to Simon Peter, the same way that God used Nathan or Philip to proclaim to Nathaniel. In the same way that God used Paul to proclaim it to Onesimus. God has put somebody in your life to share this with. He's done it, yes, for his glory, but also for your fullness of life. There's something so unique about responding to this call to evangelism. And all of our sharing is only from a place of our receiving. Recall the words of David in Psalm 23. My cup overflows. And in my life, when I'm constantly reminding myself of God's goodness through his gospel message, I cannot help but share. And there's nothing more fulfilling as an act of worship than to proclaim his goodness about Jesus Christ and what he's done. So it is such a privilege, an honor, and a joy to proclaim this message, to be a light bearer to a darkened world. There's both duty and privilege in evangelism. For my second point, we'll read this 1 Corinthians chapter 2 text. Paul writes this to the church in Corinth. And to put it shortly, this is how he describes his evangelism while he was there. 
Paul writes, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming the testimony of God in lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in the plausible words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So we see, Paul wasn't so concerned about being a gifted orator or coming up with this cunning analogy or having a calculated apologetic argument to appeal to the thinkers of the day. In his own estimation, he wasn't the world's wisest man, not some extravagant moralist or philosopher. According to Paul, he was simply Christ's herald. And Paul decides to know nothing To know nothing except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And this is our second point. There is no evangelism without the gospel. There is no evangelism without the gospel. For true gospel evangelism isn't primarily presenting general truths about God's existence or moral law. Although that may be included. And it's not primarily presenting Jesus as a helper or a wise man or a friend. Although it may include that, true gospel evangelism, rather, is the good news about how sinful men can be reconciled to to a holy God through the finished work of another, the Lord Jesus Christ. Later in this letter, chapter 9, verse 16, Paul says, Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. For Paul knows, without knowledge of the gospel, No man can be saved. And this reminder in God's word and in his gospel that it's a free gift helps us to be humble and peaceful in our sharing, gentle, courteous, patient. For we know it's not up to us. In short, it makes us good neighbors. And good neighbors make for some quite winsome evangelists. So I hope this is just refreshing to you that we don't have to be extra. We don't have to do too much. We don't have to psychologically coerce people or guilt trip them because it's not about us. And in my life, in my former days, especially in undergrad, I would concern myself with what's a dynamic question that I can come up with to spark gospel conversation or what's, what's a a diagram that I can draw on a napkin at the cafeteria and explain the gospel. And I'm not saying we shouldn't be strategic with our evangelism or evaluate its fruitfulness. It's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying, evangelism is not defined institutionally as in what we do or how we do it. Rather, gospel evangelism is defined by the message in which you share. It's defined theologically according to what you're saying the gospel. So it's not about the mechanism through which we share it. Because I see a lot of people in our church that walk in this daily, but it's different. To some people, it's one-on-one mentorship. Some of you, you open your house with great hospitality and share. Just for some of us, it's campus outreach. It could be a tent revival. It could be here on a Sunday morning. So it's not about the mechanism. It's about what we're sharing. And when Paul says, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified, I hope that's refreshing because it's good news. You don't have to exegete the whole Old Testament to be able to trust in the gospel and share it. You don't have to know all the words of soteriology and expiation and propitiation to be able to share the gospel. You don't have to have a polished eschatology or even know what the word eschatology means because it's not about you and I. It's about what Christ has already done for us. This is why the gospel can be trusted by a PhD researcher at the med school or by somebody who can't read. This is why the gospel can be trusted by our nine-year-olds in the children's ministry or by a 90-year-old at the Glenmary who has dementia. It's a message about a finished work that the Lord has done on our behalf. And this is the backbone of revival. This is my dream. Revival is ignited by the gospel and fueled by the gospel. 
This is what our pastor's cohort has been burdened by. Studying this semester. Praying for this semester. Dreaming of. And if you look at the history of revival in church history, well, you'll see a group of people so moved by the truth of the gospel that their knees are bruised with prayers of intercession for their neighbors, for their city, for their world. And it becomes like the the words of the prophet Jeremiah. He says, there's a burning fire shut up in my bones and I'm weary of holding it in and I cannot. This is the root of revival. It's the gospel. And I want so badly to see spiritually dead men come to life. My heart so yearns for gospel saturation at my school. It so yearns for gospel saturation and transformation in the city of Memphis. And I know that God wants to include you in it. He specifically placed you in that neighborhood. He specifically placed you in your workplace. He specifically has you going to that gym or that ball field. Wherever you are, day to day, God has put you there for a purpose. So join, join me this year in God's work of restoration. Share this gospel for God's glory and your fullness of life. The Bible gives God's answer to every problem in the sinner's relationship with himself in the central message of the gospel. And God's way of saving people is to send out his servants to go and share. And then he does the rest. He gives the men new heart. And I want to leave you with just this encouragement. If we regard this as a human enterprise, well, it's a hopeless task. But praise the Lord, it's not up to us. You or I have never saved anyone. We've just been a vessel of God's spirit. And God says this about what happens when the seed of his word is sown. Isaiah 55, 10 and 11. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. This is a promise from the word of God that every time the gospel is proclaimed, it will never come back void. He promises, and we know God is not a man that he would lie. Has he said, and will he not do it? We know that what God intends for his word, it always comes to pass. And that every time the finished work of Christ is proclaimed, Satan trembles, heaven rejoices, and God is glorified. And his spirit moves mightily when this finished work is proclaimed. And we can bank this year on the promise that God restores people to himself as the words of the gospel is shared. It's good news. Is such good news. And I, I haven't had time to talk practically. And if you're desiring more equipping in this, there's so many people in our church that walk in this daily. Any of our elders, people like Katasha Ross, are walking in this day to day and can help equip you. But more than anything this morning, I want to put in you dreams, dreams of revival, and invite you into God's work and seeing it happen. So join. Join us as we share the words of this gospel to all those who need to hear. This week, as with other weeks, we're going to get to hear testimony um, from a member of our church. This week, uh, I want to invite up Miss Anna Lang to the stage. So Miss Anna Lang, she's a recent graduate of the University of Memphis. She's now part of Downline's discipleship program as she's being equipped for a life in gospel ministry. And she's one of those people I just mentioned that are walking in this daily um, So I just want you to be practically encouraged by what she has to say. So Anna, thank you for being here. What's up? Hey. Um, So quickly, you kind of shared with me how you came to faith. So what was that story kind of like for you? And how did you first hear? Yeah, so despite growing up in a Christian household, I pretty much grew up around hearing the gospel verbally my whole life. But it didn't really take root until I was about... 18, 19 years old, when two friends, one of who goes here, um, two friends invested in me just by spending time with me and answering my questions about faith and God. And, and then I gave my life to Christ in 
fall 2018 um, during exchange program. Cool. Awesome. So like faith comes through hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. So praise God that he put that friend in your life. Yeah. So Anna, would you just kind of just help us to see how this works out day to day in your life? And what are some of the things that you do to see this come to fruition? Yeah. Um, well, it's actually really funny that I get to talk about this this morning because this year specifically, I have spent all year um, asking fellow believers who I look up to over and over and over for stories, specific stories of just how they transitioned a regular conversation into a spiritual one. I asked like Lauren Vernon and just all these other people. And I say that to let you all know that this is an area that I am still growing in. Like, I don't have it down yet. And um, yeah, I, I just wanted to learn like new ways and ideas of like kind of what to say, I don't know. Um, and so um, one of the biggest things that I've striven to put into practice from those conversations is um, to really lean into encounters that seem brief, like whether it's your neighbor or you happen to see the same cashier um, at some coffee shop you love, or if you see the same cleaning lady come in at night when you work over and over and over, like just a simple nod and wave kind of greeting, you can evolve that into um, a conversation or like a full-on relationship. And so just pay attention to, to those people who you see over and over and over. And they could just be brief interactions. I know when I'm at work, I fall into the trap of like having a script of just, hey, how are you? Bye. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, like uh, just as, a, and as an example, there's this 72-year-old man at the gym and he goes there every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday. And, you know, just brief nods have evolved into me asking, like, oh, are your finches done molting yet? Or, um, <laughs> and eventually, um, like, he'll text me, like, song recommendations. And... Um, he, I baked him a cake one time and I brought it to the gym and just those brief interactions can turn into really, really sweet relationships. And when you have those relationships and then you establish trust with them, um, it can be a hotbed for gospel conversations. And um, I think I wrote down a verse, aside from the Great Commission, that really inspires me. And... Um, puts it on my heart just to share is Romans 10, 14 through 15, which says, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Um, and so I'm all too aware of my lack of confidence in this area, just, it's hard, it's intimidating, it's scary. And just the number one thing I have to do is pray. Just get on my knees and talk yeah. to God about it. Um, just because I know I don't have the words. I don't have the words. I don't have the perfect theological argument to like pitch to them to make them hop aboard the Jesus train. I just can't. <laughs> and so, yeah, I have to pray. Like, I'll start my day off. Like, God, I just pray that you would give me one, arrange one divine appointment for the day. I don't care where it is, who it is, just one thing where um, I can share something, some, something of my faith, something about God, something about the gospel, anything. Mm -hmm. um, and so I pray that. And even when I'm about to hang out with like a friend, I mean, you know, the, the Great Commission is go, therefore, and we go places every day. Like I go to work at the Y. I go to the gym, I go to the grocery store, I go hang out with friends, and so whenever I hang out with someone who I know isn't a believer, I'll pray, like, somehow, God, just make a space mm -hmm. in the conversation. Um, and I also have to pray that I don't get silenced by fear of man and fear of rejection. I have to pray that so hard, because there's so many times where there's like a perfect 
opportunity that is just laid in my lap and I get scared, I get cold feet last yeah. minute and it, it sucks. Um, and so I have to pray not only for the opportunity to arise, but for the courage to take it. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think, and just as a one last little example, there's a Bible study that I'm helping out with for Global Friends. Um, and we work with international students. And um, this one girl, she's from Bangladesh. We were talking one night and she just said um, that she doesn't feel peace not knowing who God is. She knows that there's a God, she just doesn't know which one he is. And she said, and she pointed to her Bible and she was like, I think it's this one. Um, I just don't, I don't have the faith, but I, I kind of want to. And so we had an amazing conversation that night. And I was able to get really raw, honest answers from her just by asking very simple questions and then listening fully to what she had to say and just inviting her to share, inviting her to share, and not me like pitching, this is what you need to believe. Um, and I just sat there and listened. And um, yeah, I did get to share the gospel with her that night just by nodding and asking like, what do you think about this? And oh, like tell me more about why you believe that. And just she just felt really safe to be vulnerable with me. And so that's super important is um, people know when you're trying to sell them something and um, you can't mm -hmm. treat this like, like how you would anything else. Um, you have to build rapport with them. You have to be intentional. You have to give them your time um, and not just drop the G and dip. Like, you can't do that. <laughs> or you can, and that does work sometimes. But yeah, that's all I have there. That's awesome. Praise God. I don't know if I can add more to that. <laughs> um, so lastly, Anna, do you have any just specific encouragements or an exhortation for us as the church in this new year as we go out and just seek to do this? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if you feel like you don't, you're lacking in your abilities to do this, then you would be correct. Um, <laughs> you don't, and you can't do it on your own strength. So, you know, um, you have to remember that God is the one who prepares hearts. Yeah. He is the one who changes them and it's not it's not your pitch your powerpoint worthy argument that gets them god is the one who yeah. waters the seed and changes it yeah. so that's a huge relief honestly that's a huge relief to people like me um because you could butcher the gospel you could butcher sharing it you really could and you could say some crazy disorder type mess thing and God could still use that, yeah. apparently. Um, he could still use that, which is crazy. And I've seen it happen before where I was like, I don't know what I just said, but I don't, I think that was like her heretical, whatever I just said. <laughs> but God, just in seeing your heart behind it, he's like, yeah, we can, we could tie up those ends. Um, and so that's encouraging. That's encouraging. Um, is that he's sovereign and you are not big enough to screw up his plan of redemption in someone else's life. Amen. Um, Amen. And the exhortation uh, for you guys is just a reminder that global missions and having a heart for the nations isn't an elective in the church. And I love that ICC just really shows their heart. And we have Go Month coming up. But, um, yeah, there's you don't have to get on a plane to be a missionary. Yeah. You can Our church calls us to live with a missional mindset every day, yeah. every day. Yeah. And um, yeah, we have thousands, thousands of internationals right here in Memphis, Tennessee, living on your street, living in the same apartment complex as you do. And you would be surprised just how receptive and willing they are. Like they just wanna be known. And the biggest thing you can do is invite them into your life, give them your time, and um, really care for them, not just like a project, but really see them as, so, as a real friend in your life. Um, and yeah, that's all I got. That's awesome. Praise God, Anna. Would y'all give her a round of applause? <laughs> and I just leave you with one final encouragement and plea 
for 18 years of my life, I had no relationship with Jesus. And you could have summarized my life with two words, pain and regret. But Jesus' arms are open to you today if you would turn to him in faith and repentance. And there's no greater need for your soul than the redemption that Christ is offering you. So come to the Lord. Come to the Lord. There will be elders up here today that will pray with you. Come. And if you've known of the Lord's mercy, come. Be a part of His work. He wants to use you for revival. Would you come? Don't harden your heart. Come today with earnestness and with urgency. For I believe that God will do a great work in these people that are here today to send them out to bring about gospel revival in our neighborhoods and in our city and ultimately our world. So come. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your good news. Thank you so much, Lord, that you were willing to take our place Lord, to bear our burdens, Lord. And we know it is by your stripes that we are healed. All our hope is in you, Jesus. Thank you that from your fullness, we receive grace upon grace. Lord, and your mercies are so new every morning. And Holy Spirit, we dream of a gospel saturation, a transformation, and a revival. Individually in the hearts of men today, Lord, and I intercede for our neighborhoods. I intercede for the city of Memphis. And I intercede for the world that doesn't know you. Lord, would you save them? By your sovereign grace, let it be your will that you would save them. For your name's sake, God, and for your glory. And do it through these people, Lord. From their lips, let let them declare good news. Of Jesus Christ and him crucified, our risen Lord and our risen Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for today. Bring up men into this harvest, Lord, for the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. We trust in you, Jesus, and we worship you now in spirit and in truth, Lord. It's in the precious name of Jesus, I pray.